Welcome to the Cambridge Tech Podcast, talking all things technology from the heart of the UK's tech capital. Here are your hosts, Faye Holland and James Parton. Hi, I'm Faye. And I'm James. Joining us today is Dan Rook, who is the COO and co-founder of Start Code On, a life science accelerator and fund here in the city. And I'm really looking forward to exploring how the support ecosystem in Cambridge has developed over time. So, Dan, thanks so much for joining us uh, on the show today. Why don't we get started by getting to know you a little bit better? So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so a slightly unusual background, I guess, to get to where I've got to, which uh, started off started off life doing a law degree uh, post post college. Got that, did a postgraduate in uh, qualification in law, then decided that I didn't want to be a lawyer, so I joined the police force for a few years, which was enlightening to say the least. And then uh, decided I didn't want to be a lawyer. Came back into being a lawyer for for several years. Went through the whole collapsing of layman's, uh, which as a corporate lawyer wasn't a fun time. To, to be a lawyer, I've got to be honest with you, and then ended up moving um, post layman's uh, into Cambridge into a law firm called Taylor Vinters, where I became a technology lawyer, and then spent most of my career in Cambridge. And the majority of that having been at Taylor Vinters, a, a large venture capital technology focused law firm called Taylor Wessing, which I stayed till 2016. At that point, I decided to move in house, so I became a general counsel, a venture backed uh, pharmaceutical company, someone who used to be my client, and um, went all the way through kind of a venture-backed fundraising processes for them. They eventually came to the point where we sold three different products in in, in more than eight countries. So I had to, had to kind of live through all of that, the commercialization of rare and orphan pharmaceuticals, you know, getting drugs reimbursed and, you know, going from effectively no revenue all the way up to, up to revenue generative. And then that and my background kind of set the foundations for, for, for me and Jason, my co-founder, starting Start Codon, which is a venture capital fund that runs a venture building program and the fund is 15 million we've got 17 companies at the moment which have raised you know well over 35 million in the first two years which is great and we've got we're about halfway through our investment period so we've invested broadly half half the fund gone to the two and a half years of investing to go to we want to invest in 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 up to 48 companies so quite a bit of work to do but but yeah that is all going well but a slightly different background i guess and in, in many ways to to venture capital than than you might expect yeah, I mean, it sounds like, you know, a really varied set of experiences there. Obviously, you got exposure to, I guess, the world of startups through Taylor Vinters and technology law roles you were you were performing. I mean, was entrepreneurship always something that you were attracted to? Was it always on the radar or was that interest in getting more hands-on with startups sparked through that kind of process? I think I just get bored. To be honest, I think that's the driver. That's the driver behind it. So you kind of get to a point as a lawyer where you either want to do the law, you want to you want to sell services, or you want to do something different that expands your your skill set. And I found that I was doing very large financings, particularly at Taylor Wessing. They were great, but you know you do much much of the same stuff. It's not cookie cutter stuff, but it, it is. You know, there's a lot of similarities in what you do day to day, and it, it can be very rewarding when you get a deal done. But ultimately, it's you know for me, it wasn't what I wanted. So for me, the the desire, call it entrepreneurship, call it, call it what you want, but the desire to kind of do what I've done has really come about from wanting to learn more about the industry, learn more about finance, hone my skills as a kind of, I guess, you know, I consider myself an executive in many ways nowadays, but, you know, give myself a rounded skill set. And I guess with that comes a degree of wanting to take risks, because if you always, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. So I think, I think for me, what really triggered it, if I'm being honest, was a reflection of kind of where my life was going in 2016. My daughter, unfortunately, passed away. She was stillborn. And at that point, you, you, you force you to look, look quite heavily at what you want to do and what you like doing and where you want to take your life. And, you know, for me, it, it sounds, you know, almost prophetic in that sense. But, you know, I, I sat back, thought about what it is that made me happy, what I wanted to do, where I wanted my life to go, and decided to do something different as a result of that and in many ways i found that you know what happened whilst you know something that took a long time to work through almost you know gave me the confidence gave me the ability and the desire to kind of go off and actually pursue what i wanted to do 
So in many ways, a negative event with positive outcomes. And I kind of, I kind of look at, look at that and what happened to my daughter as a, as a blessing and a gift from her in many ways. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, so with regards to you're on the entrepreneurship journey now, can we just unpick a few things that you started to talk about? Uh, going back to Start Codon, how did that actually come about? Did you find, did you see a gap? Was it a conversation with you and Jason? How did that actually come about? I think all the best things come about over beer, don't they? <laughs> so it was it was literally a chance meetup. Um I'd I'd express a desire to to do something different to, to make my way back into venture capital when the company I was with before started to get revenue generative. My interest lies in kind of the early stage stuff that you know the evolution, the pace of it, and when you get to sell products and you get to the point where people are making revenue, then actually your, your model changes, how you view changes, and the type of what you do changes because it all becomes as you'd expect about about generating profit, maintaining profit, and increasing that profit, and so. You know, for, for me, I'd express a desire to do something different. I think Jason had just finished um, his fundraisings uh, with Cambridge Epigenetics. And I think we've both been talking to the same people from being in the venture capital space. And it was a chance meetup of minds uh, over a drink where, you know, we started talking about this. And it kind of went from there. And the desire was really a, a view of, look, you know, we both we think there's a gap. A translational gap is where we where we came out between looking at university funding and, 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 and institutional funding of, of healthcare and life science products and the, the kind of valley of death between the grant kind of academic funding side of it and the commercial side of it. And I think for us, you know, we saw a gap there uh, which n- needed to be filled. I think, I think, you know, I think we do lack, particularly in healthcare, not as much in kind of mainstream tech, but in healthcare, we do lack that that cover that translational piece, that value of death, where academic financing ends and commercial financing starts. So the intention was always to bridge that to improve the translation of technology and of science from academia to a commercial entity, with a view of ultimately, you know, getting products to patients, you know, helping to cure diseases. You know, it has to be lucrative for everyone. So there's a degree of making money of that in the process, and also to perverse, you know, to the kind of hit our perverse desire, both of us to. To do something different and to have a varied day-to-day life in terms of what we do and what interests us. So, yeah, all good things I think come around over beer, is what I concluded. I think there's many a program in Cambridge that that talks about chance encounters. So I think you're you're on the mark that a lot of conversations happen in the pub and in the networking activities. Did it happen uh, in the lab or was it in the pub? That's oh. Jason's bar, right? The lab. But yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So uh, not in the lab. Uh, we have done a few chance encounters in the lab, but not. Uh, no, this was in a different pub. We're going to come on and talk about funding for your enterprises. Actually, I'm quite interested in how Start Codon is funded. I understand it's a mix of private and public sector. Yeah. So, so our, our fund is a mainstream venture capital fund. It's no no different than many venture capital funds that are incorporated in England. So we have a set of investors that we had to raise finance from and we then invest that money on their behalf, you know, into opportunities that we think can generate return for them fundamentally. Um, so, so exactly the same as anyone else, you know, the structure of our fund is no different, even though it's a smaller fund, no different than say, you know, hundred million pound fund. It's just the way it is. So, you know, for us, our view was to get a nice, a nice spread of a small number of investors, which you know fulfilled both strategic aims in terms of, you know, giving us access to pharma because we're a healthcare life science only fund, and that access is really important. So we've been very lucky to be supported by Genentech and Novartis, which is good for them because it gives them, you know, in many ways sight of some of the deals that we're doing there's no rights of first refuse or anything like that but you know pharma comes into fund for strategic reasons so that gives us access to that element uh, there are private investors whose you know re- aim is, is is longer term return which is good that gives us a different driver there which enables us to access different parts of the market and then there is public finance uh, local authority finance uh, in the fund as well again although we're a national fund we can you know invest outside of cambridge we, we are based in cambridge and you know we, we're very visible about this on our website but you know we consider it to be the life science hub of europe and so strategically you know having having someone like the local authority in in the fund is great because 
it enables us to 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 bring people to a what is effectively the most lively vibrant life sciences ecosystem in europe you know and as a result it's staffed out for that purpose it's got great cro's great cmo's you know it's got you know investors who specialize in the area it's got facilities it's got a lot more it, it, you know it, it's it, what is here in many ways doesn't do justice to, to the size of cambridge it's so disproportionately focused on 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 that sector in terms of its facilities compared to other places in the uk it's, it's the place to be i think in in my opinion for what we do and so there's a nice nexus in terms of you know ensuring that that's based in Cambridge, we can bring people here because that doesn't just benefit local economy as well. It also benefits the companies because they've just got that foundation in which they can, you know, from which they can build. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely come back and talk about Cambridge in a second. You know, when you f- reflect back then, we've kind of heard how it all came about and how it's financed. So looking back, were there any surprises, any challenges in terms of setting it up? You know, have you got any wisdom to share? Because obviously, startup support, scale up support is a very hot topic in the UK today. And we're seeing accelerators and funds appearing not just in Cambridge, but across the UK. So, you know, what can you share from that kind of experience of going through that, that setup process? Yeah, try, try not to be a first-time fund manager like Jason and I um, at the same time as a pandemic kicks off is generally, I think, a, a wise advice. Uh, so, we, you know, it, it, raising money in, in companies and raising money in funds is a different ball game entirely. And for people who are doing that translation, say they've been entrepreneurs before or they want to raise a fund, it's, it's, it's very different. The investors you approach, the metrics you have to look at, they're very different. Although it all comes back to, in many ways, to return on investment or strategic return, in many ways... You know, it's very, very different. The type of people that finance funds are very different. The type of things that they look out for and how they base their decision is very different. And if you're a first-time fund manager, and what I mean by that is someone who's not managed a fund before or been in a fund. So for Jason and I, we both, you know, helped to raise capital in our previous enterprises. We both got backgrounds in, in, in science and technology. So we had all the backgrounds. What we hadn't done is, is actually invested. And if you're a first-time fund manager, try and persuade people to give you money. It's not an easy task necessarily. You might have some you know, credentials, you might have a, a you know an exit, but don't automatically take a you know take the view that it's easy to then go off and raise it um, because people do care about track record. They do care about having a history. So, you know, we decided to go off and raise the fund. It was going pretty well. It's quite a good market. COVID hit, and although COVID in many ways has height, heightened focus on healthcare and life sciences, so I'll talk about that in a sec, but. You know, at the time we raised it, the market just stopped, right? I mean, <laughs> it literally just stopped because no one knew what the impact to anything w- was going to be. And so, you know, we managed to, because we got some strategics involved who could see longer term, we closed our fund in two parts. We did a kind of a, a part close at the start with our farmer partners and we brought other people in when the impact of COVID was, was becoming clearer. And I think, you know, the impact of COVID for healthcare was a, was in many ways... It was, a, it was a good and a bad thing. It focused on the importance of vaccine. It, it focused the world on the importance of science and healthcare and, you know, looking at solutions. So you saw a big shift in the market at that point in terms of people focusing on healthcare plays, looking at, you know, what to invest in the healthcare space. And in many ways that, you know, ended up being positive after we'd got through the initial really bumpy period but end up positive for the industry. And, and you know, you, you're seeing a cooling of that now because there's a big focus on vaccines, but there's still a lot of interest there. But, yeah, I would say don't make assumptions um, that just because you've done something before you can necessarily do it again. Try, try and put your timing well. And, you know, macro environment of the world at the moment is a very, very interesting place to be. And, you know, if you're going to do it, you've really got to nail down what your USP is going to be. For us, we knew at the time, you know how we wanted to position this where we wanted to be what we wanted to do that that landscape's now changed but at the time we were one of the only people in healthcare doing what we do now there's been some additions to the market since then but you know ironing your usp outs is, is super super crucial super crucial it's, it's crucial for raising finance full stop but you know for a fund which is a relatively heavily you know there's over two thousand funds that operate in the uk you know, it's, a, it's a it's a heavily fish space 
I think anyone who's who's survived the last couple of years and and even th- you know some have thrived. I think you you've set yourself up really well for for moving forward, which is is great. And also you've you've been through it, so you've lived it, you've breathed it, and that that'll give additional empathy to all of those those companies that come through the fund with you as well. I want to pick up on the USP thing. Um, as a, I don't know if you know, Dan, I'm a comms person at heart. So I, I love a hook. I love an angle on something. And, and you have this one, start something amazing, which I think is great. And that's definitely coming out in the conversation. So my question to you now is, is more about the people that you're attracting. How do you go about attracting them and then selecting them? Two parts, I guess, to that. So the, the attracting part, it, it's interesting because... We aren't the largest fund in the world, right? And, and so we offer checks of 250K starting, 250,000 and 500,000 for tech. That's not a bad starting number for healthcare, life sciences, particularly if it's a therapeutic. So you're developing a, a product, a pharma product, a, you know, gene therapy. It's not, it's not a lot of money. It doesn't get you very far. And so the, the instant reaction, and you find this a lot, you know, scientists um, – are very, very committed to what they're doing. And therefore, there is a degree of being siloed on what they're doing and thinking that in many ways that, you know, what they've got could could be the next big thing, could be a great thing for what they're looking at. And in many, in many, in many instances, it, it can be. But, you know, as a result, what you find in the early days is that people focus a lot on money because they're like, well, I need this amount of money to develop this product without, you know, fully understanding the, the, the you know, what's needed to kind of get there. And so for us, the money part is important because we can bridge that gap and we can attract people with that promise. And we do that through social media on the website, through face-to-face contacts, through working with industry and universities to, to do that. A lot of our companies, are, out of the 17 we've got, I think it's 13 or 14 of them are university spin-outs. So you know, a lot of that comes from, from, from the institutions. But we can attract them with the cash. That's great, but it's never the determinative factor. For us, you know, it's the combination of cash and support. We've got a, a very highly skilled team. We've got a small team, but highly skilled, all, you know, I, I would say, you know, experts in what we do. And what I think is a very unique understanding of building businesses, because we've had to build them ourselves before. Um, in, our, in, in previous roles, you know, we've been involved in, in startups. We've had we've had to do that, so we we understand it. We've we've been there, done it, and we've built this up from scratch as well. And so, you know, we have a unique perspective as business creators of doing what we do. And the people that we invest in are attracted to that because what they're doing is typically building businesses from scratch. We're normally the first investor on the cap table. In many instances, we're instrumental in spinning the companies out from a university. So from nothing into something so you know build from scratch job and for us our usp is not just the cash but the venture building element that we provide and that is you know we have weekly meetings with our companies we've got a a very well-defined program that my colleague hannah runs and you know we've made a lot of changes to that over the years based on uh, you know last few years based on feedback but you know the idea of that is to help upskill the founders on on areas that they might reasonably wish to be upskilled on and give them insights We've got a, a database in the background that help that we can use to help founders. We've got a great network of people who we work with, whether that be investors or pharma partners through our fund or otherwise. And it's really access to to all of that, the people and the fact we can provide genuine hands-on support having done what we've done is I think what resonates with a lot of the people that we're investing the most. It's kind of like, look, guys, we've been there, we've done that, we've been in the trenches. Yes, there are other people that can offer more money. Number one, how much money do you reasonably need at this point? Number two, actually, you know, for a lot of people, they think they're ready for more money than they actually are. And they need they need to build up their team. They need to build up, you know, what they can do, not just through cash, but, you know, otherwise, you know, just their people strategy. So we can do that. Um, and just on people, we've also, you know, we're also one of the few funds that has a talent director uh, and plowman who's amazing and her job is to work with the companies on talent strategy. You know, what will define the success of these companies and, and whether they get more money it isn't just the money and the, and the kind of the, the, the commercial support we can provide them, but it's about attracting the right talent because people, you know, investors invest in people as much, if not more, than they invest in tech. And for us, having access to that network, having some of them specialisms to help us build these companies to, to help us find the right people to drive them it is what is going to set them apart and is the reason why our companies you know in the first two years we've, we've invested 
you know, um, you know, less than half of our fund, and they raised, you know, well over 30, 35 million. So, you know, it, it's really important. It's a really important focus area that I think we can offer that other people can't at the stage that we invest in. If you are a startup looking to grow in Cambridge, the Bradfield Centre offers a range of flexible membership packages which put you in control of your office and home working mix. There's a vibrant, collaborative atmosphere, on-site cafe, plenty of green outside space and regular member social events. We also offer a range of high-quality meeting spaces for hire and for tech event organisers, our auditorium, Lakeside Pavilion and Atrium spaces are perfect to bring your communities together for in-person and hybrid events. For more information, visit bradfieldcentre.com or call 01223 919 600. Can you give us a flavour of, you know, maybe just as a barometer of how healthy the uk life sciences sector is you know how how many companies do you get applying for each cohort you know are you massively oversubscribed and if you are you know how do you go through that selection process and do you encourage people to apply for the next cohort you know what what does that look like yeah so, so as, as it turns out we don't we don't actually run cohorts anymore we we, we changed our models so we have a kind of a continuously running program um, just because it enables us to invest in companies opportunistically as well rather than trying to fit them into a into a bucket so we still we still invest in the same number of companies each year which is you know broadly between eight and ten um we still run the program it's just we run it differently to fit around um, a slightly changed investment mandate but fundamentally we are we are doing the same thing I, i'd say we're actually doing more than we originally said we were going to do in terms of filtering we have a network of people who work for us who do some initial triage in. we've got an investment director michael Salarco, along alongside jason and we filter companies out from the applications and you know, to the extent that we then think there is um, interest, there's opportunity in the technology, we'll take them into a further diligence stage. And if we're happy with it at that point, you know, we will start to to ramp up, do some real detailed diligence. We'll we'll go out to our um, investment advisory committee, which is our our kind of um, sanity checker, for want of a better phrase. And we will get their opinions on the opportunities before before we invest in them. In terms of what we invest in, we focus on platform technologies. So, you know, we focus on something that can be applied and the business model can be used in a, in a, in a multitude of different ways, whether that be giving the company opportunity to commercialize the product itself, you know, whether it outlicenses it or or whether it pursues a, a different avenue for revenue, like you know, slightly less sexy for us, but, you know, like a kind of like a service provider or quasi service provider or partner so i think with us we look at we look at the opportunities do they fall within scope healthcare life sciences yes or no in which case then what what are they what are they doing are they a platform play if they're not if they're just a we've got one asset we've got one asset that we want to develop take a risk on us we'll pass because we like the variability because companies need to pivot in the early days and sometimes what they think they're going to do isn't what they end up doing but you need to have that optionality to do that so, you know, does, is it a platform play? And then we come down to the fact of, right, okay, look, what's the team like? How receptive are the team to bringing others on? Because it, it's often the case that the people who start the business won't come into it. If they're academics, they'll, you know, many of them have a, have a lab that they want to work in. So then you've got to look at how you staff the business, how you resource it. What are the people like? Do they want to bring other people, other executives onto the board or not? If the answer to that is no, it puts a question in our mind because we've got to be able to grow a company based on the team. And so we do kind of a multi-pronged assessment based on whether it's the right fit, what the team is like, what the technology is like. And at the end of it, what we then do is we look at the company and say, right, realistically, in light of what this company needs to do, can you know can we exit it within X number of years? We've got quite a long fund, but we still need to divest of our investments within ten years or so. And so we you know we also have a look as to the type of technology. And what you see a lot of funds doing is they invest in longer term plays at the start of their fund, which is which is what we've done, and they start to invest in in differentiated plays that they can you know look to exit on a slightly shorter time scale later on in the fund because they've got to divest their investments towards the end of their fund life. So. All of those factors come in. Are we oversubscribed? Yeah, we get a lot of deal flow. We get a lot of deal flow from words of mouth, from social media. You know, we've built up the social media profile quite extensively over the first two and a half years of, of being in operation. And 
you know, for us and also from direct referrals and, and introductions. So it's a filtering process each year. And, you know, what we hope to come out with from that is is the right companies that fit our mantra, what we want to do, you know, and want to grow a business in the way that we want to help them grow it that fits in with the profile, if that answers. It's quite, it's quite a lot of quite a lot of stages to go in, unfortunately, but I don't think it's any different with a lot of venture funds. Going back to a couple of things you said there and just trying to get the Cambridge angle, you've said 13 to 14 out of 17 are from the university. Which universities and how many of them are Cambridge? Just under half of that are from Cambridge. So they're from the ecosystem. The university of Cambridge is, is the most prolific university in the UK for doing um, spin-outs. It's certainly the most successful in terms of stats. But in terms of quantum, it does, it does a lot of spin-outs per year. And, you know, we're very, very lucky, I think, to, to be a part of that and very grateful to be a part of it. And there's some amazing, amazing technology that comes out of the university, you know, which has a, has a real focus on innovation. Outside of that, uh, we've done spin-outs from uh, Imperial College, uh, from Warwick University. We're working on, on a couple of spin-outs from the south of England at the moment. We've done spin-outs out of Birmingham. And then we've done not necessarily spin-outs. We've, we've done a couple out of, um, that, I, that I, I can't really talk about, but out of existing companies, um, one of which is is local. And then the rest of them out of the portfolio that are not spin-outs are opportunities that have come up about from founders creating their own AP, maybe putting their own money into a business. And they're, you know, a mixture of, of Cambridge, you know, we've got one in Oxford and some others. So it's a nice, it's a nice mix um, of, of companies from the portfolio. And a lot of those, some of them aren't based in Cambridge, but they resonate with the services and the breadth of offering that Cambridge can have. And a lot of them actually use service providers within the region, you know, and or look into you know, to open up, um, you know, offices in the region in the future. So although that outside of Cambridge, Cambridge is in itself, you know, um, does does offer benefits from being connected to it. But we can say we can invest, you know, nationally, but it's just the the, the region's just got such such a good infrastructure that it doesn't make sense to to, to, to ignore it. So, I mean, obviously, life science companies have a much longer gestation period than, a, say, a tech startup. But, um, you know, anyone breaking through, showing those kind of signs of high growth, you know, any kind of stars in the portfolio that you could maybe talk about? Yes, yeah, so a, lot, a, lot a lot of our companies we don't shout about in the sense of we don't, it's not that we're not proud of them at all. But we are very proud. It's just in the healthcare space, you find that sometimes if you, if, if you profile raise too early, particularly when the company maybe hasn't you know, shored up its IP position, its intellectual property, its patents, that actually shouting about it can be negative. And so I think, you know, from our perspective, our fund is, for its stage and size, it's performing very well. And it's just we're, we're quite cautious about what we let into the market in terms of, you know, shouting about what we do. And, and there's a process of, of announcing it at the right time. But, you know, we keep largely quiet because our LPs, our investors don't don't need us, don't require us to shout about it. You know, what they really care about is is growing the company, is growing the technology. And if we choose to do that uh, in the early days by intentionally staying quiet, which is what we do in a lot of instances. And in fact, some of the companies aren't on our website. So if anyone's gone on there and wanted me to talk about 17 and they're not being 17, it's because they're not on there for, for a reason. Not not that I'm crap at maths, which would be a bit rubbish in finance. We're just quite careful about that. So do we have performers? Yes, we've done rounds for our companies over 10 million. We've got several you know, potentially large rounds that we're negotiating at the moment. We've just finished our first Series A, and I think I can say in a company called Enhanced Genomics, um, and we've had some great performances, um, really high growth. We had a round that was oversubscribed by four million, you know, as an example, recently. That's not yet being announced, so I can't really talk about it. But yeah, we've got some great performers in the portfolio we're raising, not an insubstantial amount of money. You know, we're talking, you know, in the everything from kind of two and a half million all the way up to you know just over ten million range. So all in all, really happy with it. For us. You know, it, it, it shows what we're doing is working. Uh, a lot of the big performers, actually, the ones that have raised cash, uh, you know, in many ways it validates our thesis because if we've, if we're the first, you know, we've, we've invested in 17 companies, right? 13 or so are spin outs. 16 of the 17 were the first investor on the cap table. So we've, we've been foundational in setting those companies up. So in many ways, each of these companies that raises finance, each of it that does well, validates the thesis that we've got which is that we can 
you know, the trans- there's an important role to play for private capital in translating good opportunities from the bench to a commercial entity. And so every company that we get that, that gets funded validates that thesis just by, by definition. So, Dan, you've talked a, a little bit about the type of support that you offer um, your companies. Being the eagle-eyed researcher that I am, um, I was looking at a post on LinkedIn earlier, and you're running an event, doing a showcase, I believe, with some of your companies. And I quote, it says on there, you're running this event with people who are helping us deliver this event in the way we want to deliver it. So I'm reading between the lines here, what are you doing that's different? And is that therefore suggesting that you think you have a different approach to what's being done in Cambridge and maybe a different view? I think yes. I will say that I think what we did last year uh, has been copied a bit. We've had some people say to us, it's a great idea, we're going to take that. But what, what we do is, you know, for us, we're all about showcasing innovation that we have helped to to create, and and we you know number one we should be proud of that, and, and and are proud of that. And number two, you know, part of our job is to is to raise finance into these companies. Are some of the companies that we, we we talk about, and I'll talk about format in a minute. You know, I've already raised finance, but actually they're just they're just great companies, and it's a it's an awareness building exercise, and it goes back to to what we offer our companies in terms of network opportunities to present themselves, you know, getting access to to um, you know the right the right people at the right time, and so the showcase it's a invite only event, and you know to the extent that anyone wishes to know more about it, we do have a registration form. You can find it on social media and just log in register interest and you know we'll look at that and uh, and send invites out accordingly so so it is it is open to people but the purpose of the event is really to showcase what we think are six of our great companies we ran one last year you know those companies as follow on from that raised over 20 million and you know the the idea really is to allow companies a platform where they can present to investors to pharma partners to people who are, you know, relevant and operating in in the healthcare life science space, so that what they're doing, the great technology they're developing, can be shown to them. You can get an idea as to the kind of things that we're working on. And so the way we work it is is we we, we hire at the venue this year. We'll be at the at the Babram, and it's going to be you know there'll be some networking at the start and finish. So not not unusual for Cambridge itself. I think what what sets it apart is that. In terms of how we do the showcase, a lot of people will, will demo people live and they'll talk about what they're doing and it'll be you know, quick in, quick off. I think for us, you know, what we do is we, we have a pre-recorded video, five minutes of, of each of our companies, which explains you know, what they're doing about their team, their USP and, and, and you know, what they're looking to do in the future. And then after that, we have a, a live 15-minute Q&A, which we facilitate with over virtual and in-person means. So it's 20 minutes in total for each company. We do that effectively six times. There's a great networking at the start, great networking at the end. And the purpose of it is to really bring about that high profile audience of pharma, investors, and other people in industry. So, so we're all focused in one space. And so for us, the networking side of it is 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 no different than you find everywhere else. How we present the companies, how we show off their technology through the video and otherwise, I think is is different for Cambridge. It's something you, you know you see more in places that come out of say the Valley in the US, and it gives us an opportunity to present the companies how how they should really be presented without the pressure of you know having to do necessarily a live talk because that element happens anyway through the Q&A. But, you know, they, they can show their company in front of hundreds of people and they can do it justice in the way they want to do it. And doing it the way we do it allows us to pull graphics onto screen, allows us to do data. It doesn't mean that people are having to look at a slide deck and hearing someone read, you know, the presenter notes and it not be engaging. It allows us to just deliver a different type of engagement, which we think really, really benefits the companies and, and benefits the people turning up to. So, you know, Dan, you've just explained your format to thousands of people. So obviously they're now going to copy it, but that's best practice. That's the way it goes. I think it's not about what you do. It's just being the best at doing it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You, we, we have to evolve. We, we run 21 to watch and it's the same thing. You know, the, the formula gets gets utilised elsewhere. But you know what? It keeps all of us on our toes and that's that's got to be a good thing. It's about relevance. It's about it's it's about you know being able to being able to pivot, and that's no different than the companies we invest in, right? Yeah, you know, some people come to us and there's competition in the market, and you think, well, actually, 
clearly there's got to be a differentiator in the market. But what we're looking at, you know, whether the idea is new, the idea doesn't have to be new. It just has to be the best and the team has to be the best at delivering it. So for us, we agree. Everyone, you know, everyone wants to step up their game and, and do it. That's great for the ecosystem, but also, as you say, it keeps us on our toes and ensures that, you know, when we look to refine our event, when we look to how we launch our event and there'll be, a, you know, our own branded digital portal for this event, which there wasn't last year, which people can log into. They can find out information about the companies. They can find out information about us and everyone else. It just gives us more incentive to do a better job because imitation is the best form of flattery. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, Dan, you, earlier in the conversation, you touched on the support uh, that you provide as well as the the check. Could you just expand a little bit in terms of what those support services look like? And maybe as a, a second part to the question, how important is that support to the founder in terms of their motivation for applying to start Codon? Let's distinguish between kind of, I guess, material support and support, which is which is not necessarily you know, tangible in terms of items and things like that. So, so on the, what I think is the most value, and actually it's the hardest thing to sell in many ways, is the support from the team. So it's it's the fact that, you know, I have a a, a legal background. I was a very you know a high performing lawyer before this in terms of you know rankings and things like that in the UK. So I've got I've got a lot of background and over three hundred financings of everything from kind of you know, what we invest in 250k to 500 all the way up to, you know, over 250 million and I've done M&A deals, you know, reaching into the several billions. So, you know, you've got my experience as a lawyer, you've got Jason's a, a fantastic experience because his, his brain's the size of a planet of fundraising, of pivoting, you know, um, you know, his previous company of strategy. You've got Michael, who used to be at CI UK, who has, you know, he's got a double, double first and many other things. Um, but, you know, he's got experience of, of drug development in Cancer Research UK, which, he, you know, is in the new product, product innovation team there. And so he's got a real deep understanding of cancer therapeutics development. You've got M. I said, who's our, who's our talent manager, 20 years qualified in terms of you know her experience, most of that at ARM, she was an AstraZeneca. So, and, and we've got you know Hannah Rathall, who runs our program, who's a very seasoned marketing and PR exec. And so we've got we've got lots of highly qualified people who can provide insights that I think a lot of people can't provide. And we give access to the entire team, to the companies. And I say that's the hardest thing to provide because I think in many ways, you don't know what you don't know when you're starting a business. And I found this out when Jason and I set up Start Code on. And so sometimes you think you know what you're doing. And, and and you think you know what you're doing because you've always done it that way. So if you you know if you're a if you're a scientist and you've not you know spun out a company before, you're going to be amazing at the science. You're going to be great at applying for grants, but you've never run a commercial entity, and they're very different. And so sometimes you know we find that people can apply what they've already done to start a business, which is not the right way forward. So I think the most valuable part of it, and the part which sometimes doesn't resonate, but definitely resonates when people get to know us and get to see what we can do and how we can help them build the business is the people. And we can genuinely offer something that is unique, you know, that is very hands-on. We meet the guy, you know, we, you know, our companies that we've invested in that we've run the program, you know, every week, uh, we, we cut strings at some point, obviously we can't manage 17 in one go, but when they've raised later finance, they've got larger investors in, you know, we tend to take a step back, but we're very hands-on. And I think that is that you know that is the reason why the portfolio so far is 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 doing as well as it's doing, and that is the kind of you know the, the, the kind of immaterial in terms of it's not a material gift part of what we do, and you know we do a lot of support around the edges, not just in the one you know just in, in the meetings we have with them each week, but but otherwise we you know we do a lot of work. We help them with strategy, we help them with pitch decks, we help them with their budget and finance, and we connect them with the right providers, you know, whether it be accountants, banks, you know CROs, CMOs to 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 really, you know, get the people who they should be working with in the early doors around the table so that we can build these businesses in the way they should be built, as opposed to doing it in a piecemeal exercise, which, you know, just has the potential to, to go all over the place. We keep them very focused. In terms of tangible support, you know, we we will look to help the, you know, the founders get six months of office space. You know, there's we've got a really wide network in terms of VCs, pharma partners that we can access. We've got a you know, database in the background that the companies can, you know, can, can access. You know, recordings of presentations we've done, or you know, we're in the process of building up articles and other helpful tools and template documents. And then we've got the program itself, which Hannah runs, 
and that you know consists of consists of a lot of things but you know the core part of it is we run you know quarterly sessions focused on different topics with our founders we have keynote speakers that come to those we have networking sessions at the end and they are focused on say you know we call it the start program it's you know one is start to make money that's focused on financing you know budget impacts the next one is start talking with people it's all to do with things like investor relations pr and marketing we have one that's focused on ip and one that's focused on people on the on the, on the importance that is people and hr and strategy and we bring in specific people who can help really get in the weeds with the founders as part of that and and then we you know arrange the network and event accordingly. So it's it's a lot more around just the cash. And I think for us, you know, we find that ends up being particularly useful for the founders because it, it helps them do what is, in fairness, a very hard transition journey normally from being an academic or being, you know, an inventor of intellectual property to, to being someone who's commercial or at least enabling them to get people around the table who are, you know, who've had experience, who might be more commercially minded, because some fans are very self-aware that that's, that's not them, but they're equally open to, to enabling people to join the business who are. It's great, Dan. I mean, start code on there. You're definitely doing something very exciting. It's really holistic, you know, completely integrated. And I have to say, I think the team, when they listen back, they'll be really pleased with you because you've showcased them all really beautifully. So well done with that one. Um, how do people get in touch with you if they want to find out any more? We answer everything on the on the social media platforms. If people want to get in contact via social media, they can. Uh, we have a we have different forms on the website um, which integrates to our back end system. So we have a form for people who want to be considered for investment, which then comes straight straight through to the team internally. We also have forms for people because again, you know, what we want to do is collaborate and help to build. And so we have a we have a form for people who want to be involved in our companies as say as an advisor or a mentor or a, a you know director. Where you can fill in, you can register, you know, your background, your details. And then when we look at you, when we look as part of people strategy, you know, in our network, it enables us to, to find those people through through doing that. Uh, we run an intern program because I think it's important to give back. So we work a lot with the University of Cambridge, um, but we have interns and we also have, you know, placement schemes. If people are interested in, in getting experience, because that's really important for a lot of people who want to break into VC or consulting or pharma, you know, we offer that and you can register if you're a student listening to this or, you know, or actually, you know, you just want to fill a gap on your CV, you can do that online. And then we have one for um, people who want to co-invest alongside us. So, you know, they want to know more about the portfolio. They want to know more about working with us, either investing in our companies or investing in, you know, alongside us in new opportunities. You know, we, we allow people to kind of go on and register. So I, I, my recommendation would be, best way is to either reach out personally through socials or, or, or direct to our start code on website or to register your interest through the website and all of that will come back to us it may mean we don't you know necessarily get in contact straight away if you're registering to be say a you know a mentor but the details are there we do regular audits with every company that we invest in on you know who might be right for them to join and we'll reach out um you know if that experience resonates that's brilliant. Um, thank you so much. And thank you very much for your time. Do, do pass on our regards um, to the rest of the team as well. And I'm sure, we'll, I'm sure we'll catch up at a networking gig at some point in the future. Today's show was produced by Carl Homer of Cambridge TV and supported by our media partner, Business Weekly. The Cambridge Tech Podcast is available on all major podcast platforms and on cambridgetechpodcast.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give it a five-star review. It will really help others discover the show.